Have you ever wondered why a Scientologist, after the abuses that we hear from ex-Scientologists, would stay in the cult? Reminds me of people who do drugs on the street and were suffering from addiction. Why do they keep doing the drug? Why are they addicted? Everyone looking in just says, stop doing what you're doing. You don't really know until you've been there. Karen De La Carrier is going to teach us today and tell us really why people believe in Scientology. <laughs> we are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. This show today on the Scientology topic, where I've interviewed so many people so far, really top players in this, this is going to be a good one. You want to stay tuned. Today we have Karen De La Carrier, and she was the wife of Alexander Jentz, the president of the Church of Scientology International, and she was on the boat, the ship, with L. Ron Hubbard for years. She knew the man personally, and I want you guys to hear from her mouth, from her experience, what it's been like. She's no longer part of the church. They obviously have done serious damage in her life, and you're going to hear more as we do more episodes with her learning about this horrible cult. And, you know, I've been doing a lot of cult stuff lately, but, man, Scientology is something else. So with that being said, welcome to Myth Vision Pod Podcast, Karen, and we'll, we'll just welcome. Hi, Derek. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad you're joining me today because our small conversations, there is so much for you and me to discuss about your experience and exposing this cult for what it really is. So the first thing I'd like to ask you, just to get us into this, let's just get right into it. Why Scientology? Why would anyone be loyal to the organization? What does it give them? Like what, what, I don't understand. Good question, Derek. Derek, there's something called a high. Now, you are a remarkable escapee of knowing what a drug high is or was. There's something in Scientology where you're in this incredible bubble. You're in a room with just the counselor and you. And the counselor's full attention is on you. You are the only person in the world, the sun rises and sets with you bearing your soul, giving up private data. Mm. And it's cathartic. And sometimes the questions are quite clever. And you kind of just feel exuberant or you feel all your mental worries, troubles, mental masses, everything goes away and you feel the world looks brighter. You, it's a, a sort of an ascension or altered state. Now, people get this with drugs. My goodness, mm -hmm. people get LSD and they're in a different world. They're elephants <laughs> walking in the room. And the, the, so this is, Scientology can give you an altered state. And people just cannot get over that. They're hooked. It's a drug. It's an addiction, technically. An addiction. Absolutely. And, and without it, once you have it, without it, you feel empty. You feel completely... Well, you want to go back to that. You want to have that again and again. You want that, that high. So especially in lower level techniques. Now, Scientology is very deceptive. You're not going to be told what lies ahead up the line. Right. But right now, I know when people talk to me, they say, but Karen, you're speaking, didn't you have wins? Didn't you feel elated and exuberant? You see, they're hooked on that win. Derek, you can relate to that. Give me a little blurb on why a person would redo a drug after the high. Explain to it, it to the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll give you a quick snippet. I felt like you said that I had importance. I mattered, but not only did I matter, 
the drug also made me feel this false sense of I can do more than I could have done before. This has made me stronger, more powerful. Alcohol was like that. I grew six feet taller and stronger and, and more uh, not nervous to approach a female if I was trying to say, hey, or, and the same thing goes with, with heroin. Heroin for me, I didn't feel alone. I felt like God flew down from heaven and wrapped his arms around me and said, everything's going to be okay. And you are the special one. That's, that's drugs for me. Derek, you said it so perfectly. You see, it's a want. A human being with all his travails and hassles at work and a bad boss and a grumpy wife. And he wants out of he wants a release from all of that. And sadly, potent drugs can produce that. Even alcohol why are why are there so many alcoholics? They get that high. Is a certain time in drinking alcohol where an introverted person is all extroverted. He's, you know, the alcohol made him bold and brave and blah, blah, blah. This is what a Scientology session can do early on. You can get a win which just takes you higher mm. than your normal run of the mill existence. So, this is interesting. You say early on, and I have to poke because this is amazing. We know, uh, you know, really, you really know this, but I know a little bit now from talking to you guys, and I say you guys as in like plural, many of you who've experienced knowing the secret lessons of the history and all that, um, early on, they give you just enough to get you hooked, but you yeah. don't realize there's a, a darkness uh, of, of why this felt good and what was that release you're experiencing? Oh, there's a story behind that. So I guess low level people don't really know what's going on until they start pitching in the money. So I think it's important to say the bait and switch is unbelievable. Can you elaborate on what that is? Cause here's the drug you're high. Oh man, this is amazing. And they keep coming back for more, but now things start to switch. Yeah. You see the bait and switch is a lot more than the doctrines suddenly becoming an exorcism cult where they're going to flush out all these spirits glued on and attached to you and your body. The bait and switch is they had no idea how authoritarian the laws and the rules are going to be. If we say, dump your wife and divorce, you will do it because we order you to. So, Part of the date and switch is how incredibly the doctrines and procedures become sci-fi and out of the world. That's, that's a bait and switch. But another bait and switch is they never tell you how harsh their disciplines and orders and commands, the authoritarian, they don't reveal any of that till you're several hundred tens of thousands of dollars into it. Then the hammer comes down. This so. reminds me of my addiction. I'm not even kidding you. It's everything you said, like my addiction became more powerful than the love. And I, I don't mean that I didn't love my family, but like mm. it, people on the outside cannot understand that. They look at us and they go, you're a piece of, you know what, or you're worthless. or you might as well just die. That's how people are. They're very judgmental, but it, it obsesses, it becomes part of your primal instinct of survival. It's as powerful as food and sleep and water to the point where you're willing to neglect family members and stuff like that. I, I just think that's unbelievable the way that that happens. And all the while you're being love bombed when they know they can extract a lot of money. You got a huge savings account. You got an IRA. They know every single they love bomb you. You're going to be featured on the magazine cover, standing near David Miscavige. If you give the cult five million dollars, you can pose with the head of the church on the top of the magazine cover. That's five million. Just five million hard cash. This is a, this is a cash. This is a runaway money extortion racket, and you are love bombed as long as they know 
oh, my. <laughs> it's all good. The kitty. Is that okay? Yeah. That okay? So let's so, see the kitty. Huh? Let's see the kitty. The, I, 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 I've been doing country and Western dance for many years, and I used to feed this stray cat when I was dancing on Saturdays. And finally, I thought, my God, nobody's feeding it during the week. I got it. I'll, I'll put the cat up, but I'll, I'll, I'll introduce him to your audience. Okay. Okay. Derek, I brought him home off the street. So I didn't know if he had feline AIDS. Hey. I didn't know if he was. So I brought him home. And I took him straight to the vet because I got a couple of other cats. And I was waiting and waiting for the test because what if he were a street cat, right? Yeah. And I was, I put it on Facebook and I had all these people caring and got the test results because I didn't know if I had, you know, yeah. if he was just had Paris, you know, and every test came back negative. Good. He became my beloved. His name is Tiger. We just discussed pretty much how this is like an addiction. It's unbelievable the comparison to the way a lot of these cults manipulate the same places that drugs or gambling or things like that, because they give us such a sense of uh, fulfillment. Yeah. And you, you've surrendered your thoughts to being a slave to L. Ron Hubbard's teaching. And the crazy thing about this is you actually knew him in person, yes. but can you describe what, what it means? Hubbard becomes your personal truth. Yeah. I love that question. See a person, a human being will cling on to a personal truth, even though it defies all logic. Look at, look at the way a devout Islam will go for jihad and he believes truthfully in his personal truth that beheading you because you're an infidel is what Allah wants him to do. Right. He believes that. He believes that burning people alive in a cage. I don't know if you've seen some Al Jazeera videos. I've seen some. Yeah. There's something like one and a half billion Muslims that believe in the radical jihad that that's their personal belief does it stand up to objective scientific belief that any religion would order you to just massacre and kill but that doesn't stop the personal belief right i okay. believe i believed because of these early highs in counseling and I would counsel people and they would just now some questions are very very clever mm -hmm. let's say I asked you Derek what is the biggest lie that you have been made to believe provocative question yeah you're thinking your whole life what is the biggest lie that's a Scientology counseling question what is the biggest lie you've made another person believe. Hmm. You see, the, the questions can be quite clever. And people go, Hubbard was genius. <laughs> wow. And when you get a session of provocative questions and you get some enlightenment and you realize a few things, you're hooked. So hmm. this is trying to answer your very first clever question, which was, why? Why are they hooked? Why do they stay even when they're abused? Can I just throw in one little anecdote Please. to make my point? I'll send you pictures as well. Yeah. There was a Sea Org member who got in trouble. And you know what the punishment was in the 1990s? They have a restaurant in Clearwater that abuts the ocean the restaurant i send you a picture right on the ocean and when you are when you are like <laughs> when you've got oceanic water lapping against you 
little monocles and crustaceans start attaching themselves. That's why ships have to go into dry dock, scrape off all the monocles and little sea animals that have attached themselves. And the punishment was to make someone go down at high tide, not low tide, high tide, and scrape off all the monocles, be in the water and do that. That was the seal punishment. And this girl, oh, the waves, the high tide, she got swept out to sea. She could have died, she could have drowned. Some expert swimmers caught her, she was half unconscious, dragged her back. And do you know, she went right back on the job. Oh, she wow. had a near death experience of a punishment to clean barnacles at high tide off a wall and got swept out to sea and with complete forgiveness to Hubbard as a guru, came back and went right back into it. the job as if nothing happened. Even though she, so the reason I tell you this extreme punishment story is even with that kind of brutality and punishment, even when you nearly lost your life, you are a devotee. You wow. believe your personal truth, Derek, overrides all common sense. Her personal truth was only Hubbard can save me. Only Scientology has the secret answers to the universe. I, I can't tell you how I can relate uh, and not even just with drug addiction, my obsession in religion. And uh, mm -hmm. so I have that relate there, but I think it's interesting. I'd like to ask in this vein, is there any, because you mentioned this in the, the first question I ask about why mm -hmm. everyone who doesn't know Hubbard today, they know why, and they never met him. Was it the same when he existed, when he was alive and on the ship with you? Were people worshiping the ground he walked on? Absolutely. He was God. People would talk to him for five minutes and they would come back and say, I am floating on clouds. I just had five minutes with the, with the boss or with the commodore. And he was quite extra. He did have a charisma. He was right. He did have huge prey. He wasn't some, you know, the Dalai Lama has that. People, people flock to the Dalai Lama. But he says beautiful things like, my religion is kindness. Right. Well, what a great thing to say. Scientology is the absence of kindness. Hmm. It's domination. Crack a whip. You obey, you lower level fish. You obey, senior command. It's echelons of authority. And you literally are enslaved. Scientology takes pleasure in making you into a dot. This is this is shrinking you. This is amazing. Uh, I mean, like the way you're describing this, this is the experience of everyone who's left that I talk to. And all you love is Scientology. <laughs> you, you, your thoughts. So, so it's like everything you, you, it's everything to you, even at the cost of your own spouse, at the cost of your own blood, you know, your own family. Uh, what kind of religion can make you hate your own family at the cost of your personal truth? You know, uh, you have absolutely swallowed that Scientology is special. It's better than your, it's the most special religion there is. And your entire eternity, hundreds of years into the future, in whatever reincarnation you choose, depends on the here and now of what you accomplish in Scientology. If you, if you betray Scientology, if you step out of line, if you're kicked out of Scientology, 
you are going to die in blackness and alone lifetime it's it's the it's it's the, the version of hell you're going to burn in hell fire. it doesn't say fire but you're going to go lifetime after lifetime groping in blackness in eternity and people swallow all this they truly believe this is what i mean by personal belief once you have a fixed idea believing that you're screwed <laughs> you're screwed mm. because it's you've clamped onto this with such fervor that you can't let go even when the evidence in front of you is overwhelming that something is wrong look i took 40 years to wake up so did my grinda my grinda took 35 years well i was sea org for 20 years but then i hung on another 20 years being a good girl giving them donations but my son was in the sea org and i was partly influenced by not losing my son be a good girl do everything they say 40 years of my life 40 wow. years. and they and they keep telling you if you leave us you'll be flipping mcdonald's burgers at five dollars an hour you you're going to sleep under the bridge you they really try to tell you you won't make it without us if you start saying i want to leave enormous pressure to keep you they not only do that, but they also like have family members turn on one yes. another. You know, you tattle on your own family members. You will never speak to your mom again. You will never see your father again. Your sister and brother will disconnect, disassociate from you. So there's a lot of emotional blackmail. It, it's, it's, it's only sustainability is all these mechanisms to make you toe the line. But Derek, how sustainable is this? Where will Scientology be five years from now? Oh, I don't know. Be 10 years from now. Where will Scientology be 20 years from now? Can it really, with such brutality, exist through time and space? That's what makes me wonder why would John Travolta or Tom Cruise even want to stick around other than the fact that they, that initial experience of the love yous all around you, they still give those guys every single bit of their worship. They're like little L Ron Hubbard, so to speak. They're like, let's make sure he he's treated like a King and they might have dirt on them. Wouldn't you think, you know, Travolta and Cruz experience a totally different version of Scientology than rank and file. They're treated like royalty. John Travolta becomes a bad boy every now and again. You see pictures of him. And he has a whole machine that come and do damage control. Officer Special Affairs come and do all the mop up after there's a big lawsuit and he was fondling some chiropractor and da da da. So John Travolta has a whole personal army of defenders, his own personal PR machine. Hmm. That's, that's a nice bit of carrot to stay on. Tom Cruise is treated like absolute the king of the castle. He's never experienced one day in the RPF, hard manual labor cleaning bunkers with a toothbrush he's 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 treated like the king of the world he's only experienced high admiration room service counseling the counselor has flown to his apartment or house he's pampered beyond belief so they aren't experiencing the scientology that rinder and i and all seal members have experienced He's oblivious to it. So his personal truth is that Scientology <laughs> is the greatest thing since apple popping. And this I, I want to get in a lot. I want to get in with you in another show on just Travolta and Cruz. Boy, have I got some stories for you. I definitely want to. I, I want to do that. But we agreed to just make these short and snippety. Yeah, Not yeah, yeah. Drag on and on. We've got tons of topics well that, we, that leads me into the vein you 
these guys believe just like the initial uh, person who's not got that kind of money, who's just showing up, who might have something they can milk, but they show up and they're told, you want freedom? This is what we have to offer. We're going to give you freedom. But freedom. Tom Cruise and, and John Travolta, for example, they still believe this because they've got their, their big horses that are just producing milk by the bucket and they're just keep on, just keep on milking it. And they, they feel like there's freedom. I've seen the videos, but this is what's crazy. The person who comes off the street, like me, if I were to join, right, they offer me freedom. They say freedom from this freedom from that at the, what cost of selling my own soul. I mean, that's, you great. know what I mean? Like great point. One thing I would add is, Oh, for 25, 30 years, we've heard John Travolta, Tom Cruise, John Travolta, Tom Cruise. The big question is, how come no other A-lister ever joined Scientology? I will tell you why. Mm. Scientology is suicide in Hollywood. Absolute career suicide. You know, Tom Cruise has never chosen to give it an Academy Award a presentation. First, he's never won one, but he's never chosen to even donate. These guys, the, the word Scientology in Hollywood, in spite of their celebrity center, it's a death sentence to your career because Scientology has gotten, I mean, it's the joke, it's the butt of late, -like, late night comedians give up. <laughs> <laughs> so the big question is, they haven't even gotten one A-lister after 30 years. That's all they have. Cruise Travolta, Cruise Travolta, Cruise Travolta. No, no newbies. There's no one else in who's any big star, a uh, B-lister or a little bit of unknowns, you know. But there are stories to tell. Um, the version of Scientology that, you see, that celebrities see, that the outer world sees, all the fluff and froth on the Scientology TV, blah, blah, blah. And then you lift up the curtains and the darker side, the inner side of Scientology, which I hope to explore with you. Oh, we, we can have fun, Derek. It's, it's a big mirage. It feels like Scientology is like you're walking through the desert of life Things are so tough. You need water. You need food. You're in the desert. And you see this, what looks like paradise. It looks like water and trees and there's fruit and there's, and they, and that's the freedom they offer. They say freedom, freedom, freedom from this, freedom from this yeah. addiction, freedom from that, freedom from this. At what cost you're actually going toward this, what looks like paradise, but actually it's becoming a slave even deeper than you already were. Sure, we'll, 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 we'll handle some of these superficial issues. You, you're addicted to drugs? We got you. Come join Scientology. We'll give you something else to get addicted to. Um, you, you want to, <laughs> you know what I mean? We'll give you something else to replace this. Well spoken, Derek. Well spoken. So I hope to uncover a lot of their dirty little secrets with you in forthcoming videos. But we agreed to make this short and snappy what would you what would you say was your lesson learned let's help coach our audience in the few minutes we've had together today what is there something you learned from what i said i know you suddenly got it on the drug high and the scientology high you got some you got a little bit of wisdom out of that what, yeah what? i i think that this is what ultimately i gained from this and i hope anyone watching was this is, you know, there's levels of cults and how good a cult really is. These people really go to the top of knowing how to manipulate uh, the faculties of our minds and the way that we think and the way that we feel so much that you're happy to give them your money. You're happy to sell your soul. You're happy to throw your family, kids, wife, children under the bus. You're happy to do whatever they say. And to me, there's nothing more harmful than things like this existing and are getting thumbs up from the government. Yeah. Like, no, I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. I've been interviewing lots of ex-Scientology, ex-Jehovah's Witness, ex-you name it. 
And I see a common trait, but these guys are the the four star generals of cults. And well spoken. I mean, I can't wait to get into this next time. I hope everyone's cliffed hanging from this because she's going to tell us about Tom Cruise. She's going to tell us about John Travolta. We're going to find out things that you will not find. You have to dig and you don't have to dig very far when we could talk to Karen to find out some of this stuff. I mean, there's so much dirt that she really has on the cult. I hope you guys stay tuned and go to her YouTube channel. She's got stuff there. Also, your husband has a blog. All that's down in the description. Is there anything else you could tell them that we could look forward to on the next show? If you are somehow watching YouTube channels to gain a little bit of knowledge, get a little wiser than you were before you watched that show. And if you are pursuing truth as opposed to the froth and fluffer, the propaganda, please stay tuned to MythVision because Derek has this great urge, this great dynamic thrust to expose life. That's why the word myth, what does myth mean? <laughs> so if you have any kind of thing in your soul to get a little more truth, then watch the channel because we're going to, this is a channel that exposes lies. I'm definitely excited on the next show, exposing more of the stuff that's been going on with this church for a long time. L. Ron Hubbard has uh, a horrible military record. He's saluted by people like he's some honorary dishonor dishonorable discharge. The guy is not what you think he is. And we're going to expose that. You might as well see the dirt. We're not going to hide it from you. And, you know, that's how we do here. Because who are we? We are Miss Vision. Ha, 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 ha.